as said, I'm Felix Kolinshev from the Estonian Maritime Museum. And today I will speak about Fabian Kotlin from Bellingshausen and the first uh, Russian Antarctic expedition that took place in 200 years ago, 1819 until 1821. Uh, I will start uh, with two quotes. Uh, the first one is by Robert Parkin Scott, famous British uh, explorer, and the other one from the famous Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen. Uh, I will read them to you. Uh, with wonderful pertinacity, the intrepid Bellingshausen again and again steered his ships to the south, and he succeeded no fewer than six times in crossing the Antarctic Circle. Although he did not reach such a high latitude as his predecessor, on the whole, his course lay to the southward and he still further narrowed the limits of the southern land, which had been so greatly reduced by Cook. Uh, Scott wrote these words after uh, his British Antarctic expedition that took place in 1901 and 1904. And during the heroic age of Antarctic expeditions, uh, Antarctic exploration at the turn of the century, so more attention began to be devoted to the uh, southern polar region. And Amundsen uh, himself, uh, after he conquered the South Pole, he wrote, we must always, always remember with gratitude and admiration the first sailors who steered their vessels through storms and mists and increased our knowledge of the lands of, the, of ice in the south. They shaped their course towards the dark unknown, constantly exposed to being engulfed and destroyed by the vague, mysterious dangers that lay in wait for them somewhere in that dim vastness. So for me, this is very so interesting that 100 years after Bellingshausen, uh, he was still actually remembered and also Cook uh, during the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Now, Bellingshausen himself uh, was born on 20th of September 1778 in Lahedagus, a manor in Saarema. After his father died and the family had become impoverished, uh, he was ad admitted to the Naval Cadet Corps in Kronstadt when he was only 10 years old. He graduated the school uh, as a Mitchman which was a 12th and lowest rank in the Imperial Navy back then. And after school, he served in the Baltic fleet from 1797 until 1803. And in 1803, Krudenstern actually chose him to be a team member of the first uh, Russian circumnavigation, and he was a cartographer on this uh, voyage. Now after the, the first Russian circumnavigation, he served again on the Baltic, and after that in the Black Sea fleet. Uh, and then he was placed in command of the Russian Antarctic expedition. Uh, after the expedition, again, uh, he served in Kronstadt, uh, uh, then Black Sea again, and then in the 30s, 1830s, he most probably served in Tallinn, in Estonia, in the, in the Baltic fleet again. And uh, his two daughters uh, were born there in 1834 and 1836 making it likely that he, he lived there in, during this period. Uh, the house, which he probably lived in, is today the Swedish embassy in the Tallinn Old Town, Big Street 28. Maybe some of you have uh, seen this. And uh, pre uh, earlier, there was also a memorative uh, stone on the, uh, on the house, but uh, today it's not there anymore. Now, his final years uh, in the 1840s, uh, he spent uh, in Kronstadt, he was a military governor of Kronstadt, where he led extensive fortification and construction works designed to improve uh, the quality of life for seamen and civilians as well. And during this period, in 1843, he was promoted to Admiral in the Navy, and Bellingshausen died in 1852 at the age of 73 and uh, is buried in Kronstadt, Russia. And today also, the grave is not known exactly where it is, but uh, there is a nice... Uh, memorial from him, for him erected there. Uh, in 1819, the Russian Empire decided to send out two expeditions, one to the northern polar regions and the other to the southern polar regions. Uh, already in the ancient times, uh, it was believed that there had to be a sizable amount of land uh, at the South Pole, Terra Australis it was called, or else the Earth would tip over. Uh, during the age of exploration from the 15th to the 17th century, intensive searches for Terra Australis were mounted, but the southern continent was not discovered. Uh, yet it became clearer based on these explorations that the continent could not be as large as it was shown on the 16th century maps. 
uh, and even in the 18th century maps, Terra Australis was still there. But the turning point, uh, point was uh, James Cook's second uh, around the world voyage that took place in 1772 and 1775 uh, that had the purpose of finding uh, Terra Australis or Antarctica. Uh, but this ex expedition actually did much to spur the disappearance of the continent from these maps. So on uh, Cook's map, for example, there was a big uh, white blank spot on the chart. So this had to be actually filled with new discoveries. So after Cook, a uh, few people believed that uh, such a continent existed there. But one who did uh, was the Russian Minister of the Navy, the French poor Marquis de Traversay, who you can see here on the right hand side. And uh, he came up with a plan for an expedition and uh, he also sought advice from uh, different Russian naval figures. Uh, and the main idea behind the Russian expedition was to look for Antarctic and region, regions where Cook had never been. Where, so where Cook uh, did not steer his ships towards. Uh, so the question was perhaps this would lead to the discovery of the continent. Uh, it was also hoped that the expedition would bring some kind of fame and glory for uh, the Russian Emperor Alexander I here on the left hand side and the Russian Empire in general. So the expedition received its blessing in February 1819 and the ships were set to sail in, uh, in that same year in July. So that left only half a year of time to prepare for the voyage. Uh, if you compare with our voyage that is taking place today, so the time period is roughly the same six months uh, preparation time. Uh, the expedition had uh, two ships, vessels, uh, Vostok and Mirne. And here on the left hand side, you can see a picture of Vostok. Uh, it's a ship model that is uh, from the collections of the Estonian Maritime Museum. And on the right hand side is Mirne, is a drawing by the expedition's artist, Pavel Mihailov. You can see uh, later, I will show you many more pictures of, uh, of Mihailov as well. And here the technical data of both of the ships, they were uh, not uh, built uh, especially for the expedition. They were built in 1818 as uh, Navy ships both. Um, and you can see here from the technical details that Vostok was large, uh, slightly larger than the Mirne and also a bit um, uh, faster, which is why in, at one point uh, ships actually went different uh, ways and then met again in Sydney in Australia. And you can also see from the uh, complement that Vostok had uh, more men on board. Now, a total of 190 men of different ranks participated in the expedition. Uh, of course, ma majority of the crew uh, was made up by sailors who did everyday work. Uh, but besides the usual crew members, there was also a doctor, carpenter, cook, artist, and astro astronomer. Uh, now, there has been a question where there's also Estonians among the crew. Uh, it has been believed that, if, that Bellingshausen, who was born in, in Saarema, Estonia, uh, actually went back to Saarema and uh, looked for some Estonian uh, crew members, but uh, this is only an hypothesis. You can, it has not been documentally proved, but there's still there's uh, two names in Vostok's crew list, uh, Olaf Rangoel and Paul Jakobson, that might be of Estonian origin. The other hypothesis is that they were actually Swedish but uh, we can never know because the crew list, uh, as I've heard from Erkia, you cannot find them anymore from the archives, so this is only a hypothesis. Now the need to engage scientists on the voyage uh, was emphasized uh, by Krusenstern. Uh, so an astro astronomer, artist, and two natural scientists uh, were planned to join the expedition, but the natural scientists uh, missed the voyage because they, they did not uh, make it uh, to Copenhagen in time. So therefore the only uh, scientist on the voyage was astronomer Ivan Simonov, you can see here on the left hand side. And he was the astronomy professor uh, of the University of Kazan. And his main task was to carry out the astronomical measurements uh, as well as other observations in the field of natural science uh, given the circumstances. Although the main emphasis of the expedition was not uh, laid on science, still more extensive scientific observations would have contributed a lot more to its success. Uh, Pavel Mihailov, the expedition's artist here in the middle, 
uh, his task was to record everything that was seen on the spot. So nearly a couple, couple of hundred sketches uh, by him are now in the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg and uh, the State Historical Museum in Moscow. And also some of his drawings were published in the Atlas accompanying Bellingshausen's Travels Notes in 1831. So those drawings depict people, animal, bird species, coast views, icebergs, uh, and so on. It's a very interesting uh, material to, for researchers. And here on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of uh, Commander of Mirne, Mihal Lazarev, who, who you can maybe say was the second most important man on the expedition. Uh, a bit about uh, the provisions or food on board. Here on the left-hand side, you can see the daily rations of food per crew member in the Russian Imperial Navy between 1810 and 1820. Mm. Bellingshausen, however, already in Copenhagen, uh, decided to raise these rations in order for the crew to be healthy. And this turned out to be a right decision because uh, a few uh, crew members actually fell ill during the voyage. So this is one of the reasons why that was. And here on the right-hand side, you can see provisions that were ori originally taken on board uh, tons and tons of foods, also uh, uh, strong alcohol, vodka, tobacco for the crew, and of course sauerkraut, which was a good source of vitamins and protection against scurvy. So that was vital. Of course, um, uh, in every stop they made in Copenhagen, uh, London, Rio de Janeiro, Port, Port Jackson, they had to replenish the food stores, the fresh water, fresh fruit, vegetables, and so on. And maybe here uh, a small comparison that uh, when they were in London, uh, the cost of the provisions purchased uh, was 1,593 pounds sterling back then, which would today roughly be 150,000 euros. So the expedition, the cost of the expedition was uh, very, very high. The map here already that Erki also showed uh, uh, the expedition itself started in Kronstadt in 15th of July, 1819. The first destination being Copenhagen, then Portsmouth, where they also went to London. And after the preparations in Copenhagen and Portsmouth and London were done, they took the course towards south to Tenerife, uh, where they arrived uh, in uh, September, end of September, and where again fresh water, food and wine stocks were replenished. So from there on, they sailed towards South America, bound for Rio de Janeiro. All the pictures you see here in this presentation are by the expedition's artist, Pavel Mihailov. Um. <laughs> like Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. um. To continue, uh, the expedition arrived in Rio de Janeiro on 14th of uh, November, 1819. Again, uh, repriv reprovisioned, took on firewood, purchased tobacco for the crew, for example. Also, the ships underwent maintenance and the uh, health of the crew was checked. Now, Bellingshausen uh, actually put a lot of emphasis to the health of the crew. So in every stop and also during the voyage, uh, the crew health was checked. Uh, but in Rio de Janeiro, after already three months of sailing, all the crew was healthy. Uh, they left Rio de Janeiro on 4th of December, now bound for South Georgia, which had been discovered by Cook, although Cook had not determined whether it was an island or not, so Bellingshausen did that for him. It was an island, and uh, after he co accomplished this mission, the first uh, real discoveries of the voyage were done of 3rd and 4th of January, 1820. Uh, these three islands uh, were named after the Minister of the Navy, uh, Traversai, and the individual islands uh, were named after Vostok's officers, uh, Savadovsky, Leskov, and Torson, and Torson was later named uh, Vusokoe Island. Mm. Bellingshausen himself commented on these discoveries as follows, I quote, both the land we discovered in Cook's Sandwich Land are actually islands. They all have high snow-capped mountains the icy slopes of which descends to the sea, and the number of the islands have furious volcanoes. 
Due to the cold, none of the islands have plant or animal life. Some of them are inhabited only by penguins. Quote end. Now we're coming to the most crucial point of the expedition. Uh, as to whether the Russian exp expedition did sight Antarctica on 28th of January, it still cannot be answered for sure. But ba based on later research, they were not uh, uh, further than 20 miles from Queen Maud landing on uh, Antarctica on that foggy day. So had the weather been fairer, they would have certainly seen Queen Maud land. But in many places in the world today, 28th of January, 1820 is considered to be the date of the discovery of Antarctica. Although there are other opinions as well. For example, the British and the Irish consider the date to be the 30th of January, 1820, when Edward Bransfield saw the Antarctic Peninsula. Now the date, uh, 28th of January, had no special significance for Bellingshausen himself. However, he noted, having reached the point 69 degrees 20 21 minutes south and 2 degrees 14 minutes west, on 28th of January, we encountered compact ice heaped in layers. I saw many different birds, but all were seabirds, and they could not be taken as evidence that land was close by. A few weeks later, on 17th of February, however, the Russian expedition uh, uh, saw something that they could not explain. It was the edge of the ice shelf of the Antarctic continent, and Bellingshausen wrote about this as follows. Between ice flows and ice islands, I spied a large massive of ice with edges broken crosswise, and which extended as far as the eye could see, being almost like land. The level islands of ice we saw in the vicinity were likely pieces carved from the ice massive, but their edges and top surface were precisely like the massive. So these uh, two dates, 28th of January, which is considered uh, the date of the discovery of Antarctica, and 17th of February, February are now the most two important uh, dates of the expedition. Here you can see another uh, sketch by Pavel Mihailov. You can see how vast the icebergs were and you can, ships, uh, you can see the ships also there between. And then uh, here is also one uh, possibility how to collect fresh uh, water by collecting ice. And here also one uh, picture by Mihailov are the different icebergs that they then saw on the Antarctic waters. Now, before they arrived in Sydney, in Australia, uh, they saw a natural fem fem phenomenon called aurora. Uh, in terms of results of the expedition, it's not important, but I've included this picture because it's one of my favorites of, uh, of Mihailov's work. And here again, you can see the great icebergs and the ships between them and then the nice shining pillars. And the astron astronomer Simonov uh, wrote about this, I quote, I saw three shining pillars. They were the color of a comet's tail. Long did I gaze at that aurora. It would float out across the sky with the same brightness, like a river flowing in a westerly direction. Bellingshausen summed up the first navigational season as follows. I did not find a trace of the great southern continent, although I maintained a course near the Antarctic Circle for most of the time. If such a land mass does exist, it must be within and covered by ice due to which it would be unrecognizable. The crew went through great difficulties in harsh wind, dark and snow. Cold was a fixture of the entire journey. Giant icebergs, some rising to 122 meters above sea level and up to a 24 kilometer diameter, were our permanent enemy. And we took the utmost precautions to protect ourselves. The smallest mistake would have been our last. So from this quote, you can actually see that the conditions were very, very difficult. Now then, uh, in 11th of, on 11th of April 1820, they arrived in uh, Sydney or Port Jackson, uh, and they also used the winter season in the Southern Hemisphere, as already Erki had here mentioned, uh, for exploration in the Central Pacific, where Kotzebue had a few years earlier made many new discoveries. Also Bellingshausen did uh, many new discoveries. And uh, they made it, the expedition made its way back to Antarctic waters uh, again on 12th of November, 1820. Maybe the first not noteworthy uh, thing that happened there was an earthquake. Uh, on 29th of November, 1820, the expedition saw a grass-covered Macquarie Island that is situated between New Zealand and Antarctica. The ship lay at by the island for three days, 
uh, and the expedition was then startled by an earthquake. Although Bellingshausen did not much make of it, uh, the crew member, Yegor Kisselev, wrote, I quote, and then we ran aground on a sandy shoal at night. The hunters say that earthquakes and underwater volcanic eruptions in these parts are frequent. Quote then. Also, you can see here uh, the penguins and seals here in the front of the beach. Uh, also, a very nice colored picture. Now, on 21st of January 1821, the expedition was further south it would go. Uh, it has to be said that they did not uh, manage to overtake James Cook's record, but still uh, their southern, southern furthest point was 69 degrees 53 minutes south and 92 deg degrees 50 minutes west. They were forced to turn back because of the strong east wind, but this disappointment uh, was actually compensated by, by two discoveries. Uh, so uh, they were Peter the first island and Alexander the first uh, coast, which was later then uh, turned out to be that it was an island. Uh, and Bellingshausen wrote about it. The joy on our faces when we heard the jubilant cries of land, 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 could scarcely be described in words. After the long and monotonous sea voyage in constant mortal danger through ice, snow, rain, sleet and fog, there was nothing strange in this ex excitement. So the bitter, bitter the first island was discovered on the 22nd of January 1821. Uh, Lazarev himself added, uh, surprising discoveries at the high latitudes gave us special pleasure. Now, just about a week later, uh, on 28th of January, the Alexander I coast, now called Alexander I island, was discovered. And the astronomer Simonov wrote about this as follows. The discovery of these lands is important because it marks the southernmost of the discoveries. Likely no other island so close to the South Pole will be discovered soon. If Alexander I coast is not a cape of a fixed land, Antarctica then, uh, we are prepared to confirm the words of Cook and say that we did not see any signs of the supposed continent. It is possible that it does, does exist, but due to perpetual ice, it was beyond the field of vision and scope of our sea voyage and inaccessible to all. Uh, and to sum up, after 752 day voyage, in extreme conditions, the Russian Antarctic expedition arrived back in Kronstadt on 5th of August, 1821. They were given a spectacular welcome and the Emperor Alexander I uh, visited the ships himself. Although Bellingshausen believed himself unsuccessful in discovering Antarctica and reaching the South Pole, the expedition was a stunning success by today's uh, terms. The islands, uh, Peter I Island and Alexander I Island were the most significant discoveries uh, thought back then uh, and also because they uh, caught a glimpse of the ice massives uh, and Beringhausen an expert description of the edge of the ice sheet, he is now today considered to be one of the discoverers of the frozen continent. The disputes, however, uh, who was the first to discover the Antarctica continue, uh, all those seafarers sailing near the Antarctic Peninsula are believed to have seen its peaks before Bellingshausen and Bransfield. Uh, the topic was not of interest to them. And 200 years ago, or 215 years, 50 years ago, neither Cook or Bellingshausen, even less so the whalers or sealers, uh, could not have known that the continent uh, actually could indeed consist primarily of ice sheets. Only after the age, ice age theory that uh, gained currency in Europe in the second half of the 19th century, such a notion was possible. Now here you can see a title page of the Atlas of Bellingshausen voyage that was published in 1831, uh, presumably in uh, 600 uh, copies. And also there was a two volume uh, account of the voyage uh, uh, that uh, is now a valuable material for researcher uh, to, to look at. Uh, unfortunately in Estonia, uh, if you look at the national catalog of our libraries, then there's a, actually an entrance of this atlas but it has gone missing, so unfortunately in Estonia there's no copies left, which is a big shame because I haven't also saw this in person, but yeah, a great material nonetheless. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Felix, for this uh, short overview and very informat in informative presentation and, and uh, most important results of this expedition. But uh, now, other questions? Now, please have Felix out. Yeah. Uh, all together, uh, three or four men died, three during the expedition. Uh, one had an accident in Sydney, he fell off the mast, and uh, one died of typhoid fever. Uh, the third one, I'm not sure what happened, but the fourth uh, member of the expedition then died after they returned to Kronstadt, probably because uh, of something, some kind of illness he, he got there. But Bellingshausen also, as I mentioned, he put great emphasis on the health of the crew. He, had, he told the crew they had to wash uh, their uh, clothes, bed clothes regularly, also air the rooms as possible, as, as frequently as possible. So that was actually, in the end, it turned out to be a gr uh, very, very correct decision. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. More questions? Yeah. Um, the, the As far as As far as I know, the only ones that were sold were this atlas, so not uh, okay. so there was no big no. no. And this atlas actually also depict uh, uh, half of it is from the Pacific uh, part of the expedition. Uh, the native, uh, native uh, people there, also birds, uh, animals and so on, but also uh, uh, different maps uh, that the Bellingshausen then, uh, had done. Or do you have anything to add, maybe? No, not, not, not really. Only one thing I wanted to underline here, this importance of James Cook and his voyage, mm. because it changed the the strategy of voyages because he was the first who took uh, on the expedition painters and scientists. Mm -hmm. And of course, after that, every expedition mm -hmm. had on the board scientists and painters to, to fix the situation, what was seen in that time. And there was no photograph in that time, of course, it was the f only way to document uh, all these discoveries and so on. But it's interesting piece in this story because in Cairo, although they saw incredible or un understandable this ice shelf on his pictures, on his uh, paintings, we didn't see this. I don't know <laughs> why. Because it was the most mm. interesting thing what they saw. It was discussed many times uh, after after they were, after they saw this, in the two uh, crews came together and the officers discussed this question. But unfortunately, we have no document on that. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. <laughs>